Welcome back to Deep Learning and today we want to talk a little bit more about recurrent neural networks and in particular look into the training procedure. Mm, recurrent neural networks? You can't write them down in five lines of pseudocode. Okay, so how does RNN training work? Let's look at a simple example and we start with a character level language model. So we want to learn a character probability distribution from an input text and our vocabulary is going to be very easy. It's going to be the letters H, E, L, and O, and we'll encode them as one hot vectors, which then gives us, for example, for H, the vector 1, 0, 0, 0. Now we can go ahead and train an RNN on the sequence hello, and we should learn that given H as the first input, the networks should generate the sequence hello. Now the network needs to know previous inputs when presented with an L because it needs to know whether it needs to generate an L or an O. It's the same input but two different outputs so you have to know the context. Let's look at this example and here you can already see how the decoding takes place. So we put in essentially on the input layer again as one hot encoded vectors the inputs then we produce the hidden state HT with the matrices that we've seen previously and produce outputs. And you can see now we feed in the different letters and this then produces some outputs that can then be mapped via the one hot encoding back to letters. So this gives us essentially the possibility to run over the entire sequence and produce the desired outputs. And now for the training, well, the problem is how can we determine all of these weights? And of course we want to maximize these weights with respect to predicting the correct component. And this all can be achieved with the backpropagation through time algorithm. And the idea is we train on the unfolded network. So here's a short sketch on how to do this. So the idea is that we unfold the network, so we compute the forward pass for the full sequence and then we can apply the loss. So we essentially then backpropagate over the entire sequence such that even things that happen in the very last state can have influence on the very beginning. So we compute the backward pass through the full sequence to get the gradients and then the weight update. So for one update with backpropagation through time, I have to unroll this complete network that then is generated by the input sequence. And then I can compare the output that was created with the desired output and compute the update. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. The forward pass is of course just the computation of the hidden states and the output. So we know that we have some input sequence that is the x1 to xt where t is the sequence length and now I just repeat update our ut which is the linear part before the respective activation function and then we compute the activation function to get our new hidden state. Then we compute the ot which is essentially the linear part before the sigmoid function and then we apply the sigmoid to produce the y hat that is essentially the output of our network. If we do so then we can unroll the entire network and produce all of the respective information that we need to then actually compute the update for the weights. You can write them down in five lines of pseudocode. Now the backpropagation through time then essentially produces a loss function and now the loss function is summing up essentially the losses that we already know from our previous lectures but we sum it up over the actual observations at every time t. So we can for example take cross entropy then we compare the predicted output with the ground truth and then we compute the gradient of the loss function in a similar way as we already know it where we want to get the parameter update for our parameter vector theta that is composed of those three matrices, the two 
bias vectors and the vector h. So the update of the parameters can then also be done using a learning rate in a very similar way as we have been doing this throughout the entire class. Now the question is of course how do we get those derivatives and the idea is now to go back in time through the entire network. So what do we do? Well, we start at time t equals capital T and then iteratively compute the gradients for t up to 1. So just keep in mind that our y hat was produced by the sigmoid of OT which is composed by those two matrices. So if we want to compute the partial derivative with respect to OT then we need the derivative of the sigmoid functions of OT times the partial derivative of the loss function with respect to yt hat. Now you can see that the gradient with respect to w h y is going to be given as the gradient of ot times h t transpose and the gradient with respect to the bias is going to be given simply as the gradient of ot. Okay, so the gradient h t now depends on two elements the hidden state that is influenced by OT and the next hidden state HT plus 1. So we can get the gradient of HT as the partial derivative of HT plus 1 with respect to HT transpose times the gradient of HT plus 1 and then we still have to add the partial derivative of OT with respect to HT transposed times the gradient of OT and this can then be expressed as the weight matrix HH transpose times the tangens hyperbolicus derivative of WHH times HT plus WXH times XT plus 1 plus the bias H multiplied with the gradient of H t plus 1 plus w h y transposed times the gradient of o t. So you can see that we can also implement this gradient with respect to matrices and now you already have all the updates for the hidden state. Now we also want to compute the updates for the other weight matrices. So let's see how this goes. We now have established essentially the way of computing the derivative with respect to our ht. So now we can already propagate through time. So for each t we essentially get one element in the sum. And because we can compute the gradient ht we can now get the remaining gradients. And in order to compute ht you see that we need the tangens hyperbolicus of ut which then contains the remaining weight matrices. So we essentially get the derivative with respect to the two missing matrices and the bias by using the gradient ht times the tangens hyperbolicus derivative of ut and then depending on which matrix you want to update it's going to be ht minus 1 transpose or it's going to be xt transpose or for the bias you don't need to multiply with anything extra. So these are essentially the ingredients that you need in order to compute the remaining update lines. What we see now is that we can compute the gradients but they are dependent on t. Now the question is how do we get the gradient for the sequence and now what we see is that the network that emerges in the unrolled state is essentially a network of shared weights. And then this means that we can update simply by the sum over all time steps. So this then allows us to compute essentially all the updates for the weights in every time t and then the final gradient update is going to be the sum of all those gradient steps. Okay, so we've seen how to compute all these steps and 
Yeah, it's maybe five lines of pseudocode, right? Well, are there some problems with the normal backpropagation through time? You need to unroll the entire sequence. And for long sequences and complex networks, this can mean a lot of memory consumption. And a single parameter update is very expensive. So you could do a splitting approach, like the naive approach that we're suggesting here. But if you just split the sequence into batches and then start again initializing the hidden state, then you can probably train, but you lose dependencies over long periods of time. In this example, the first input can never be connected to the last output here. So we need a, a better idea how to proceed and save memory. And of course, there's an approach to do so. And this is called the truncated backpropagation through time algorithm. Also because I'm lazy, so you know, kind of. <laughs> now the truncated backpropagation through time algorithm keeps the processing of the sequence as a whole but it adapts the frequency and depth of the updates. So every K1 time steps, you run a backpropagation through time for K2 time steps. And the parameter update is gonna be cheap if K2 is small. The hidden states are still exposed to many time steps, as you will see in the following. So the idea is for time T from one to capital T do, run RNN for one step, computing HT and YT. And then if we are at the K1 step, then we run backpropagation through time from T down to T minus K2. This then emerges in the following setup. So what you can see here is that we essentially step over four time steps. And if we are in the fourth time step, then we can backpropagate through time until the beginning of the sequence. Once we did that, we process ahead and we always keep the hidden state and we don't discard it. So we somehow can model this interaction. So does this solve all of our problems? Well, no, because if we have a very long temporal context, it will not be able to update. So let's say the first element is responsible for changing something in the last element of your sequence, then you see they will never be connected. So we are not able to learn these long temporal contexts anymore. This is a huge problem with long term dependency in basic RNNs. So let's say you have this long term dependency and you want to predict the next word. The clouds are in the sky. You can see that the clouds are probably a relevant context for the sky. And here the context information is rather nearby. So we can encode it in the hidden state rather easily. Now, if we have very long sequences, then it will be much harder because we have to backpropagate over so many steps. And you've seen also that we had these problems in deep networks where we had this vanishing gradient problem that we were not able to find updates that connect parts of networks that are very far apart from each other. And you can see here that if we have this example a sentence like, I grew up in Germany and then I say something else and I speak fluent, it's probably German, but I have to be able to remember that I grew up in Germany. So the contextual information is far away and this makes a difference because we have to propagate through many layers. And this means that we have to multiply with each other. And you can see that those gradients are prone to vanishing and exploding, as, by the way, identified by Hochreiter and Schmidhuber in reference 12. And now you still have this problem that you could have an exploding gradient. Well, you can truncate the gradient, but the vanishing gradient is much harder to solve. And there's another problem, the memory overwriting, because the hidden state is overwritten in each time step. So detecting long-term dependencies will be even more difficult if you don't have enough space in your hidden state vector. And this is also a problem that may occur in your recurrent neural network.
So can we do better than this? We are happy that it works better than any competing method, but um, that doesn't mean that we, we think we are done. And the answer is again, yes. And this is something we will discuss in the next video, where we then talk about long short-term memory units and the contributions that are very well known by Hochreiter and Schmidhuber. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. So thank you very much for listening to this video and hope to see you in the next one. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.